such an honor to have uh, John Kleinberg visit us uh, today for the distinguished lecture uh, at MSRAI. Uh, John is the Tisch University professor in the departments of, of computer science and information science at Cornell University. His research focuses, as you all know, on very interesting issues at the interface of algorithms, networks, and information with an em emphasis on the social and information networks that underpin the web and other media. Um, we just had we just came out of a fireside chat that will be on hopefully edited and available um, soon, where John talked about his um, early days and reflections and interest in law and mathematics and wondering if he'd ever combine these things together in some issues that might come to the fore someday, while staring at an Apple II computer and writing simple programs and. The fact that he discovered a few years later that this was actually a field called computer science that uh, brought some of these ideas to life, but probably even back then had no idea where things were going in terms of uh, the, the work that uh, and, the, and the challenges and opportunities we now face as, as a community. Uh, John's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Engineering, and the recipient of uh, fellowships from MacArthur, Packard, Simons, and the Sloan Foundation. And he's won a number of, of uh, prizes, the Harvey Prize, the Nevin, Nevin Lina Prize, Newell Award, and the ACM Prize in Computing. Uh, knowing all, uh, a bunch about your work and following it closely, I'm sure all of those prizes were well-deserved. So, John, come on. Come up. Thanks, Thanks for being here. All right. There's the badge there. Uh, great. Well, thanks. thanks very much for the uh, invitation to to come speak here. And it's been a really fun day getting to meet with uh, so many people whose work I really admire and enjoy keeping up with. Um, so uh, I want to talk today about some work uh, I've been doing jointly with um, Sentil Malinathan, a uh, behavioral economist at Harvard who I've known for a long time, uh, and two of my uh, PhD students, Manish Raghavan and Maitra Raghu, thinking about uh, issues in, in sort of this, this emerging space of topics that sort of goes under the name algorithmic fairness. Um, and the talk will really be about some definitional questions. And really, a lot of the focus will actually, uh, in this work, be, uh, be, be about some of the aspects where we take different competing demands for what it would mean for a decision rule to be fair uh, and try to evaluate how these decisions and these definitions interact with each other. And I'll try to sort of highlight some things that I, I think we learned that's, that surprised us uh, once we sort of started to sort out, out some of these definitions, conceptual issues. Um, so this actually uh, started from some work that Sandel and I were doing on uh, human decision making and really looking at the intersection of algorithmic and human decision making, um, we, were, we were motivated by the fact that in computer science and in the social sciences, there are activities that superficially look very different that syntactically have a surprising amount in common, common with each other. So if I think about uh, computer science, <clears throat> a canonical sort of decision that we've gotten very good at is the sort of decision that you see embodied in a ranking function or a recommendation function, right? So this is a screenshot from a tutorial blog post on uh, Netflix showing how it's making recommendations. And essentially from a you know, huge amount of data about a user, as all of you know, uh, it abstracts some kind of a uh, sparse set of features um, that's somehow a thin representation of this you know, rich, living, breathing individual. Um, and it tries to predict, are they going to like this movie? Right? It's going to assign a probability estimate to that based on data they have about them and data they have about many other people. Um, and these kinds of activities in the online world are things that you know, we've developed a lot of practice at refining and improving. Uh, but meanwhile, in the offline world, uh, as Sandel observed to me, there are activities that human beings are doing that look somewhat similar, right? So hiring, for example, um, which superficially very different. Uh, certainly each individual decision there is more high stakes. But we take an individual job applicant who's a complex, living, breathing human being. Um, they submit something like a resume, uh, a CV, maybe a school transcript. Uh, and some hiring committee looks at this and decides, will this person be a good employee? In effect, part of their decision is to make a prediction. Will they do well in the environment at our company? Same thing happens with college admissions. You take a college applicant. You get some set of features about them. And some committee is making a decision, which is in part based on a prediction an estimate of their probability of succeeding in this program. Now, in the offline world, these are relatively high stakes 
decisions compared with ranking a recommendation where maybe billions of low stakes decisions are being made by the algorithm. But fundamentally, they all sort of follow this, this common pipeline, right? We're mapping an individual features to an algorithm and some sort of predictions being made. Um, here I'll think of the prediction as maybe a probability estimate. I'm going to assign a probability, are you, you know, of, about some future behavior, are you going to be in, in the positive class or the negative class? Are you going to be a yes or a no? Right? Are you going to like the movie? Are you going to succeed as an employee? So forth. Um, there are, once we think about this pipeline and how it lives both in the online and the offline world, there are a lot of questions that uh, people have, have, be, have begun to ask, uh, including questions over here on the right-hand side. Is the right outcome actually being predicted? Right? When I try introducing an algorithm into some complex situation and say, I'm here to make a prediction, are you really making a prediction that's relevant to the overall decision that society is trying to optimize? Similarly, lots of questions get asked about this mapping. Are we recording the right features uh, about an individual? Um, are those features reflecting problems that we have even in the, in, the, in the construction phase? And finally, related to these first two points, this broad question of, is the algorithm making fair decisions, right? Are the algorithm's decisions fair? And there's clearly a complex definitional question there as to what, what, what we mean by fairness. And so that's what I wanted to start from in this talk. The question of what would it mean for what would it mean for an algorithm's decisions to be fair? And here a slightly more specific question, what would it mean for an algorithmic prediction to be fair? Right? Particularly interested here in, in this act of prediction and assigning an estimate of a probability. Now I've shown you some examples, online content, uh, employment, education, all of these have this kind of thing. We, we could run through many other settings where some sort of hybrid of a computer uh, and a human decision maker are making predictions, right? In, granting loans and making medical diagnoses, wide range of areas where this template actually fits quite well. Um, I want to talk about the domain that Sendel and I have been focusing on for uh, the past several years, which is criminal justice. And we had been w working together with Jens Ludwig, uh, Yuri Leskovic, and Hima Lakaraju on developing prediction algorithms in this domain and trying to look for places where uh, human judges might be, uh, might be making errors, might be making suboptimal decisions. And around the time we were doing that, uh, <clears throat> this extremely widely circulated article by ProPublica came out in summer of 2016, gathered a huge amount of attention, and it was focused on a risk tool that was actually being used in parts of the US criminal justice system, this tool called Compass. Um, and so what was Compass doing? Compass, at a, a very high level, was uh, taking features about individual defendants and trying to assign a level of risk, a risk that they would reoffend, uh, or perhaps within our powers of measurement, at least the risk that they would be rearrested. Okay. And so it was doing this sort of a, a prediction activity. And there were some, it appeared, problems with Compass. And so ProPublica did this investigation. And it was actually a, a very nice example of data journalism, where the data they used to evaluate Compass, the code they used for the evaluation, they put all of that on GitHub so that people could replicate what, the, what, what they were doing. And they arrived at some relatively striking findings, which they reported in 36-point font uh, in their article. Um, they identified some form of bias in the decisions it was making. Now, what was the bias that they identified? Here it is sort of summarized in two bullet points in stylized form. Ah, yeah, and for those of you who uh, can't quite read the bottom of the slide, I'll, I'll read it out for you. Um, so this is assigning a level of risk to each defendant. But each defendant then goes out in the world and either commits, e either reoffends or not, which again, really to within our powers of measure, means gets rearrested or not. Um, and so the first finding was that African American defendants who didn't subsequently reoffend had higher average scores than white defendants who didn't subsequently reoffend. Right? And this fir first bullet point was concerning because what we're talking about in this first bullet is a whole bunch of people, none of whom did anything wrong in the future. And yet, the average score assigned to the African American defendants in that category was higher than what was assigned to the white defendants. Um, conversely, <clears throat> the same thing happened in the opposite direction with people who did reoffend. White defendants who subsequently reoffended had lower average scores than African American defendants who subsequently reoffended. Okay, so both of these seem like some source of concern, uh, and especially the first bullet is a good one to focus on, right? People who didn't do anything uh, 
wrong in the future, and yet we're getting these different scores. And you, you should think of the score assigned to somebody as it incurs a big cost on it, right? If you get a high score, that's now something which, is, which, which has consequences in how you get treated by, by the U.S. criminal justice system. Okay. Yeah, question. So how did they compute the first scores? Because like, if you don't release the append, then how do they compute the first scores? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. So, right, so this is something that we dealt with a lot in, in the work that we've been doing, where if I release someone, I, I find out what happened. If I don't release someone... In these particular cases, these were for offenses that were going to involve relatively short-term detention, and so they were using what happened after they were released, either immediately or eventually. Um, actually, many issues, one of which is, is that one, uh, make this kind of analysis much more complicated. And in the kind of activity that followed this report, um, a lot of the methodology here was questioned, was refined, and so forth. Fundamentally, this category of objections was robust in the sense that for a lot of different ways of looking at this, this seemed to be happening. Um, yeah, other questions about the... So, yeah. so I'm assuming the this score is significant? You're so, assuming... So the, the average, you're saying the average score, yes, is higher, but like, is the statistical is significant? Yeah, there was a relatively non-trivial difference here. All right. So... How do we know that, you know, this is just because of the ethnicity and not other factors that could be correlated to the um, I mean, the question will be to get into, like, why is this happening? I agree. We should be asking why is this happening. But, you know, we should remember that in the end, if we think about this as an activity in the world, right? So when, when we say it may have to do with the features, may have to do with covariance in the features and so forth, that's fine. But that was our decision to impose that structure on the situation. What's actually happening in the world is defendants walk into a courtroom, they're assigned scores where high scores uh, impose a relatively high cost on them in, in, in how they were treated in the future. Scores get assigned to them. They leave the courtroom, and none of them do anything wrong, right? So in the world, what's happening is people pass through the system, don't do anything wrong in the future, yet we've picked this category of people, and we've assigned them higher scores. We could discuss why we're doing that, but fundamentally, that end-to-end -end process seems like it has something wrong with it. Uh, and that, that was fundamentally their argument. Um, OK, so in the analysis that, that followed, um, the first thing that happened was people said, all right, well, if this is an issue with the compass risk tool, maybe something, <clears throat> if we want to understand what's happening, can we understand at least what compass was optimized to do? And there actually was an interesting point here. Uh, and this was made both by people who were involved with the creation of the compass tool and also by a collection of researchers in crime policy who pointed out that there's another definition that we should be thinking about when we evaluate risk tools, which was not the ones that ProPublica suggested, but rather this notion of calibration. And in fact, Compass's scores were well, cal well calibrated for each group separately. So what do I mean by calibration? So we could think of a risk tool as, you know, disc discretizing the space of risks. And so it's assigning defendants to these bins. <clears throat> this is the point 0.1 risk bin, point 0.2, point 0.4, and so forth. Um, point 0.1 means you have a 10% chance of reoffending. And again, whenever I say reoffending, I mean reoffending in the context where you've been arrested by the criminal justice system, which is all that we're measuring. Um, and... So if it's well calibrated, it should be the case that when I look into this bin, one-tenth of all the people there did reoffend, because one-tenth should mean one-tenth. And when I look into the 0.2 bin, a 0.2 fraction of the people should reoffend, uh, because that's what 0.2 means. And indeed, that is the property that the Compass scores had. And it had it separately for each group. It had it for the African-American defendants, it had it for the white defendants. Right? So their point was, when we assign an African-American defendant a score of 0.2, it means 0.2. If you were to go and look later, 20% of those people reoffended. 0.2 meant 0.2. And if you look at the white defense who got assigned a score of 0.2, 0.2 meant 0.2, right? So there's, in their argument, you know, there's not much more we can do beyond that promise. We promised that the numbers would mean what they said. They do mean what they said. Um, and adding, you know, adding race into this does not differentiate between that because it's calibrated <laughs> separately within each group, right? The score of S means the same thing. Of race. Now, you could ask, well... Is calibration important? I mean, it sounds good. Do we, is there some societal benefit to having calibration? Um, for one thing, it feels somehow like important that your tool's output means what it claims to mean. But it's also the case that uncalibrated rules can induce bad behavior. So let me just tell a sort of fictitious pedagogical story about a world in which some entity uses an uncalibrated tool, and let's think about what, what might happen, right? So suppose in my fictitious world, hospitals run a tool to predict very accurately how good a doctor you're going to be. Um, and they hire candidates by stratifying them into bins 
and only hiring the candidates with the very highest score, S star. Okay? But suppose the rule is not calibrated across groups. Right? In particular, that would mean something like female doctors with the score S star are actually more likely to be good doctors than male doctors with, with the same score S star. Right? S star does not mean S star for the two groups. In fact, the probability is higher for the female doctors who get score S star. Right? That would be what it would mean for the rule to be uncalibrated. Then the point is, as a patient, it would now actually become rational for you to choose your doctor, at least in part, based on their gender. Gender has now actually become an informative feature in your selection of doctors. The tool actually is encouraging you to do that. It says, in fact, uh, one, one group actually has a higher probability of being a good doctor than, than the other. So even if you're sort of imposed self-discipline and choose to ignore this failure of calibration, the downstream people in society may not be doing that. So this is one of the styles of arguments why you might want calibration across groups. Okay, so calibration is important. On the other hand, ProPublica's objections still remained. Um, right, they still seem to be this problem. So the question was, could we achieve all of these desired properties at once? We now have multiple properties, all of which seem to connote fairness. Um, and at, at, the, at this point, an elaborate argument ensued. And um, Sendel and Manish and I sort of watching this felt like, if we could at least write down the definitions that people were arguing about, which had so far gone sort of only partially specified, maybe we could actually look at the situation and try to figure out what the argument is actually about. And so this next, next few slides is really um, about something which mathematically ends up not being that hard. The challenge is to figure out what is the sort of definitional content of this argument. So here's what we're talking about in terms of a model. So the basic model for assigning risk scores uh, as probability estimates is that I have individuals. They each have two things that are salient. They're either positive or negative, right? They will reoffend or they won't reoffend. They'll be a good employee or they won't be a good employee. There's some kind of notion of the positive class and the negative class. Uh, and they also belong to one of two groups, right? Two groups where I'm interested in the imbalance between them or lack thereof, groups A or B. Uh, the individual gets mapped to a feature vector, and then my uh, risk score maps them to one of uh, a set of bins bin B has a score V sub B, which is sort of the probability estimate associated with that bin. Okay. So, and that's fundamentally what, what a risk tool is doing. What are the properties that I would like from my, from my risk tool? Well, here are the three that we've been talking about so far. Calibration within groups means that for each group, A and B, uh, a V sub B fraction of people in bin B are in fact positive. Um, then I have these issues that ProPublica raised, right? These definitions, which really hadn't necessarily been as much on the radar in, in the discussion about these things and, uh, until their report came out. So on the positive class, we might ask for what I might call balance, that the average score of the positive members in group A should equal the average score of the positive members in group B. And similarly, I might want balance for the negative class, that the average score of negative members in group A should equal the average score of negative members in group B. Okay. Three properties that I'm a, I, a, I'm a, I might want, all of which seem to connote some kind of fairness in the system. Okay, so let's ask, how might we try to achieve all of these properties? Well, let's first try out some simple cases where we could achieve them. The first case would be, if I, can have, if I have perfect prediction, um, which is a really extreme case, uh, then I can actually achieve all three properties, right? If the features in my data are actually enough that I can deterministically tell if someone's in the positive class or the negative class, then when I'm deterministically sure that someone's in the positive class, I give them a score of one, when I'm deterministically sure they're in the negative class, I give them a score of zero. Uh, and in fact, I'll achieve all three properties. You can, you can check that. I didn't understand. Can you go back to the slide? Yeah. So how, how do you get balanced to the positive class in that case? Um, so the average score of positive members and the average score of, in, in, in all groups would equal one in that case. As in if all members of the I positive see, class given get Given that you're positive, the average score wants to be the same. Exactly, average. yeah. Given that you're positive, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <coughs> yeah, so... In the case of perfect prediction, which we don't expect to have, we could achieve this. Um, a second case, maybe a more plausible case, where we could also achieve this, uh, would be equal base rates. Suppose the two groups have the same fraction of positive instances, some number p. Well, then at least there always is a risk score that satisfies all three properties. I simply assign a probability of p to everybody. I create one bin, I put everybody into it, and they get a score of p. Now, clearly that satisfies balance, because everybody's average is p. And it also satisfies calibration because there's a single bin and a p fraction of people in there. So in that case, I could at least get a trivial risk score. 
Maybe in the case of equal base rates, if there's some structure in the problem, I could create another solution that's a more non-trivial risk score with multiple bins. But at the very least, I can satisfy all three properties. OK, so we now have sort of two endpoints here. And so we thought about, OK, how can we sort of work our way in from these two extremes? And the, the sort of first uh, main thing I want to talk about is that you can't actually. So in any instance of risk score assignment, when all three properties can be achieved, you have to either have perfect prediction or equal base rates. These are the only two situations in which you can actually have all three of those properties. Um, so I want to walk through why that's true. Because as I said, the proofs in this section of the talk are actually uh, quite easy. And in some sense, our challenge had been to sort of unravel what was being talked about and try to figure out what the definitions were that people were, were arguing. Once you do that, it's, it's not, not that hard to see what's going on. And in particular, I should mention a couple of things about this. right? The way we've defined things, it gets us to a point where this is not a theorem that's about computational power or inferential power. It's really just about your inability to assign um, numbers to entities to equalize certain averages. Um, right? So as a result, it's not really about the limitations of algorithms. Any decision-making procedure that attempts to assign numbers to people is going to fail on one of these properties. Yeah. Also, the only score is the trivial score that you mentioned there. No, so, so actually, you have equal base rates. Yeah, if you have equal base rates, it's, it's going to depend on the instance. Um, so in fact, a slide that I don't have here, um, if I give you an instance of this problem with equal base rates, and I ask, does there exist a non-trivial score, that's actually NP-hard to figure out if there is or isn't. Because um, there's sort of a knapsack-like activity that you, or a subset sum-like activity you, you would have to do to get a non-trivial one. Um, so yeah, so it's not, it's going to be instance dependent in that case. If you have perfect prediction for one positive, one negative in both groups, then you sacrifice scores on those people to balance it out. Like suppose we know that somebody is positive, we can assign any positive score above threshold. Right. Somebody is negative, any negative score below threshold. I see. So are you, are you proposing a change in the requirements, or are you proposing a method to? I'm a, uh, yeah, like method of solution. If you know one true yeah, positive so and be, one true negative. If I have equal base rates, that's how I could start to try finding a non-trivial assignment of risk scores. I could sort of locally search for it and, that, and that's all right. If I have unequal base rates, as I'm going to argue, we're not actually going to be able to do that. Yeah. Um, okay. So this was interesting to us because it, 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 it somehow said that the crux of this debate was that you really can't achieve everything ever, that people want to unless you're in, you're in one of these situations. And fundamentally it's saying once you have unequal base rates, there's a problem, right? There's a problem that these two groups have unequal base rates and sort of no amount of clever authoring of definitions is going to really make that go away. It's, it's, it's going to show up somewhere. Um, so we went back, talked to ProPublica half a year later because it generated a lot of activity. And a number of groups actually were thinking about similar sorts of questions. And so these all got summarized in a kind of year-end wrap-up that they wrote coming back to this question and saying that, in fact, the situation was sort of, um, it wasn't just about the data that they had collected. There were, there were certain mathematical uh, issues going on. Um, some of the other work that got summarized in all of this, um, there was some nice work concurrent with ours by Alex Chuldakova at Carnegie Mellon looking at a similar s setting except where the algorithm is supposed to output a, a hard decision, not a probability estimate, but a yes-no decision. And now I ask about false positive rates and false negative rates, and there's a similar negative result about e equalizing certain sets of false positive and, and false negative rates. Similar results by uh, a group at Stanford, uh, Corbett Davies et al. Um, some nice work of Moritz Hart, Eric Price, and Nati Shrebro, who looked at the case in which you take away calibration, um, which again comes at some cost. Uh, but then we could look at a constrained optimization problem. How could I be as accurate as possible if I want to equalize false positive rates, equal false negative rates, or, or in, in our terms, impose balance for the positive and negative classes, and then try to be as, as accurate as possible, uh, which will necessarily typically sacrifice calibration. Um, we also, in a paper at NIPS this past year, looked at some other versions of this where, for example, if I want to retain calibration, I can basically uh, equalize any kind of one-dimensional combination of the balance for the positive and negative classes, but not both, both simultaneously. Let me give you a quick sketch of, yeah, question. Since we can't achieve, you know, uh, fairness, can, is there any limit on the bias that we can work towards? So, I mean, uh, yeah, it's a, right, it's a good question. So can we get some approximate version? <coughs> so if I write down the notion of approximation in a really sort of simple way, I say, 
I would like approximate calibration to within epsilon. I'd like equalizing averages within epsilon, and I'd like uh, equalizing uh, balance cost negative within epsilon. Um, then, no. In fact, basically it says you have to have either approximately perfect prediction or approximately equal base rates, and that's the only, only situation. Um, other forms of approximation, I think, are sort of in these lower bullets here where it's basically saying we may have to just wholesale give up on one of these conditions. Um, and, I, and I think part of the message here is going to be that which condition you want to give up, I'm going to argue as a sort of non-technical point, um, is going to be domain dependent, right? And, and there are certain extremes, right? There are situations where, you know, the societal cost of having unequal averages for people who committed no crime, for example, we view as very high, and that's the one we want to focus on. And if we lose some calibration, so be it. There are other domains where um, giving up on calibration for the sake of balance you know, seems to make very little sense. So, for example, take medical, take a sort of a hypothetical medical diagnosis setting where I have a rare disease. Uh, there's some test for it which returns with some probability, and the the disease, for some you know genuine genetic or physiological reason, say is more common in men than women. Okay, so the base rates are unequal. So now the risk score for that disease fits in our framework. You take the features of the person. You output a probability that they have the disease based on what you measured. It could be high, it could be low based on you know, various tests that you ran. Um, but because the base rates are unequal and you have imperfect prediction, and uh, you're going to have some disparity across men and women, right? Um, there it feels like the fact that the average for the positive class and the negative class are unequal is somehow a feature of just the nature of the disease, right? It's not necessarily reflecting something wrong in society relative to just a fact about this disease. Whereas having a rule that's uncalibrated in that case would be strange. It would mean you would go to the doctor and the doctor would say, well, we looked at some features and the thing reports, you know, a 20% chance, but because you're male, we have to adjust that because it's an uncalibrated rule, right? It, it somehow wouldn't necessarily make sense to go up calibration in that case. So I, I think which one you want to give up is going to be domain dependent. And <coughs> it's going to depend on what we view as the relative cost of, of uh, these, these different forms of unfairness. Let me just mention uh, two slides about the proof just to kind of emphasize that it's uh, really not, uh, not very complicated at all once we have these definitions. If you, if you, if you want to watch for something in, 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 in the proof, it might be the following, which is somewhere in the proof, of course, we're going to have to mention perfect prediction and equal base rates because the theorem is not you can never do this. The theorem is you can only do it in these two cases. And these two cases are kind of a combination of like a, a zero-dimensional case where things are pinned down to constants and kind of a one-dimensional case where two things are equalized. So, Somewhere in the proof, short though it is, is going to have to be kind of a, a zero-dimensional thing glued to a one-dimensional thing that's going to somehow say these are the two cases. So watch for that. Okay, so we have these groups. Uh, let's say n sub t is the number of people in group t. k sub t is the expected number of people in the positive class in group t. And I'm sort of speaking informally in all of this. It takes a little more to write this down more carefully. So the calibration condition, if you think about it, says in this bin, one out of ten people commit a crime, and we have 10 people assigned a score of 0.1, which is a total score of 1. Similarly here, uh, we've assigned 10 copies of 0.2, which is a total score of 2, and two people commit a crime. Fundamentally, calibration is saying the total score handed out in a bin is equal to the expected number of people in that bin who actually are in the positive class. And summing over all bins, it basically says the total score handed out to all of group T is going to be the expected number of positive people in group T. All right, so let's remember that. Um, okay. Let's say we have the average score of a person in the negative class, we'll call that x. The average score of a person in the positive class, we'll call that y. The key is because we've equalized the averages, that's independent of the group we're talking about. That's crucial. So here's a way to write the total score in group T. Uh, NT minus KT people were in the negative class, they get a score of x on average. KT are in the positive class, they get a score of y on average. On the other hand, we know that the total score handed out is KT by calibration. So I get this equation. So now I have two equations, one for the first group, one for the second group. Um, each of these equations specifies some line relating x and y. Here are those two lines. And now the question is, when can those be simultaneously satisfied? Well, one is at the point 0, 1, which is perfect prediction. And the other is if these two slopes happen to be equal, in which case they coincide all the way along these lines, which is the case of equal base rates. Okay. And so fundamentally that's, that's what's going on. And we have to be a little more careful in how we write everything down, but that's, that's basically it. Okay, so we looked at this, and we thought there's sort of some interesting things going on here. Um, and we, we began thinking about the ways in which probability estimates are being used more broadly, right? So we, 
we thought about this is sort of one first look at this activity of taking people and making probabilistic estimates about them and then making decisions based on that. Um, but many of those situations involve more than just one individual. Right? What, one thing that's interesting here is that we're auditing the rule. We're evaluating it by looking at averages o over groups. But the rule itself is being applied one individual at a, at a time. Fundamentally, the activity is the risk score takes in a single individual and outputs a, a single number. And there are many cases when we assign probabilistic estimates about people where what we're really doing is evaluating a group. Right? We're applying a function to a set, not to an individual. What do I mean by that? Well, we all sort of encounter that on a regular basis, right? So just to take a sort of representative example, uh, a couple of years ago there was this headline uh, during college admissions season in the Cornell Chronicle, which is our local uh, on-campus news, uh, which says the admitted class of 2019 is the most diverse in Cornell history. That's a statement about a group. The same about the admitted class, right? No one individual is the most diverse in Cornell history. It's really what happens when you bring together a group of people and evaluate the diversity as a set. I'm evaluating sets. And this was really a point brought to the fore by the work of Scott Page, uh, this social scientist at the University of Michigan who does very, very interesting work and has written for a number of years on the issue of diversity as a sort of emergent property of groups and the performance benefits of, of diversity. And college admissions is one of the examples which he, which he thinks about. But of course, there are a number of other settings uh, where we think about this, like often missing in the discussion of assignment of sort of loans, for example, where we think people making loan decisions, is that in the end, you have to evaluate loans collectively, right? You're really evaluating the portfolio of loans, not any one individually. Um, similarly, uh, a bunch of work starting with work of Scott Page uh, and then some subsequent work that Mithra Raghu and I did, which I'll mention toward the end, looking at, for example, if I wanted to select a team to maximize team performance, uh, I should be evaluating the team, not necessarily the individuals on the team. Okay. So you, you end up with this challenge uh, in which we're trying to evaluate a group by making probabilistic estimates about the individuals and what's going to happen there. So Manish Raghavan and I, having thought about this assignment of risk scores, began thinking about this in the context of group selection and asked, what are some of the issues that come up there? And we came across this, this interesting thing which really hadn't been sort of analyzed uh, mathematically, um, which had some, some interesting properties. So again, to kind of recap what we, kind of a generic situation that we're thinking about, we have a large pool of applicants. We'd like to choose a short list of K. So maybe that's our entering college class. Maybe, I guess the canonical example might be these are the job applicants and we're gonna select K to kind of interview or sort of look extra hard at, okay? And we'd like this group of K to be as good as possible. Um, now the concern is that there's bias in the system, either explicit bias or maybe implicit bias, such that uh, maybe group X is a group where we're concerned there's bias against group X. Right? So we have X candidates and Y candidates, depending on their group membership. And we're worried that whoever's making the decision has this bias against members of group X where they sort of downweight, uh, downweight them. Uh, and either it's implicit bias that they can't control or they somehow choose not to control. Um, what do we do in those kinds of situations? So there's an intervention that's become increasingly popular in, in the business world, in academia, uh, something called the Rooney Rule, and actually a number of you have no doubt encountered it even if you haven't called it the Rooney Rule. Um, and that's saying when you're hiring for a job, uh, for say a faculty position, an executive position, what have you, you commit that on your short list of interviewees, you promise that at least one of the people on that list will be from Group X. Okay. Um, right, this is the group you're concerned that you're discriminating against, so if you see a pool of interviewees and all of them are from Group Y, then whoever is higher up in management says, I reject that list, you need to interview at least one person group X. Um, why is this called the Rooney Rule? Because the first really public pronouncement and sort of commitment to this actually came in 2002 by, a, uh, by the, the owners of the teams in the National Football League. Uh, the Rooney Rule is named after Dan Rooney, who at the time was the uh, owner of the Pittsburgh Steelers, where looking at the incredibly low representation of minority head coaches in, in the NFL, which was, of course, especially striking g given the high representation among uh, the players, for example. Um, they wanted to figure out how could we increase the fraction of head coaches in the NFL who were from minority groups. And so this was the rule that they set out. And it's become an increasingly popular rule because it somehow aims at the sort of middle layer between, you know, 
no intervention, just everyone should try harder, which felt like it somehow wasn't getting anywhere. And more heavyweight interventions where, for example, you commit to actually hiring a certain number, uh, which then is subject to sort of, you know, significantly more complex territory uh, in discrimination law, right? So this is somehow something in, in, the, in the middle. You're committing to look extra hard at, at members of this group. Um, and so this has become, uh, again, sort of an increasingly popular intervention. It was invoked by uh, Barack Obama in 2015, where he exhorted the tech industry to use this in executive hiring uh, when a commission chaired by Eric Holder uh, rev reviewed the um, situation at Uber in 2017. They made this among their recommendations for executive hiring as well. Okay, that's the Rooney rule. It had an effect, actually, uh, just to kind of show a little data here. This interesting paper by Cynthia Dubois from two years ago looked at the moment the rule was introduced, just after the 2002 season, uh, what happened to the representation of minority groups among NFL head coaches, and comparing it to a bunch of reference populations where the rule was not applied, offensive and defensive coordinators, head coaches of NCAA college teams, none of whom were actually using the Rooney rule. And the two had been sort of, again, there's a lot of noise, right? This is incredibly small numbers. But the two had been sort of roughly on top of each other and diverged sharply right when the thing was introduced. So there's evidence that uh, this was actually having an effect over time. But we actually wanted to ask, in the spirit of this work of Scott Page, who wants to think about the performance benefits of diversity, right? Independent of any of the other reasons that, that we might do it, could there simply be a performance gain from imposing the Rooney Rule on, on people? Okay, yeah. Do the interviewers and interviewees know that this rule is being applied when it is being applied? In the case of the NFL, yes. Um, it's situation dependent. So the, the original articulation of it was yes, there was an extremely public commitment to, to, to this, and so everyone knew it was being employed. Um, you can imagine situations where <clears throat> a firm decides to use it but not to announce it, and then you might have a different situation. Uh, is there anything that happened that led to the drop in the end? There's been some discussion that uh, there's sort of two theories about this. One is it's small numbers, this is noise. Uh, the other could be there, there's concern that the rule is beginning to break down in that increasingly people have a sense of who they want as their head coach, and so you end up going committing to somehow you know, a set of interviews that don't actually have much power because you've sort of all already decided. And so there's concern that people are now have learned how to engage in the rule sort of in, in, in form but not in, 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 in spirit. It's unclear though, yeah. Um, okay, so pure performance benefits from this. Why might there be a pure performance benefit from using the Rooney rule in this case with probabilistic prediction? And again, for performance, I need some kind of an objective function. And I'm going to start with the objective function that just says, I would like to maximize the sum of the qualities of the K people that I, I interview. There's a choice there because you could say, well, I'm just trying to hire one person. I should just maximize that person. But there's lots of evidence. And one of the real motivations behind introducing rules like this is that all K people you interview benefit from the exposure of being interviewed. For example, the people involved in interviewing them all go off to go work for different firms or different teams or whatever over time, uh, and they're going to be involved in recruiting, and they're going to have people who come to mind who are in their working memory, and if you were interviewed earlier, there's a benefit to you. So I'll start with something where we're looking at the sum of the qualities of all K people you interview, in that all of them are somehow relevant to the situation. Here's a model where I'm going to try to suggest that there might be a performance benefit in cases where there's biased evaluation. Okay? The model is going to have the following three ingredients. First, I have a pool of job applicants. Uh, each one has some potential for future performance. Okay, this can be a stylized model, as with our previous set of slides, where I'm going to try to, what are sort of the minimal set of ingredients I'm going to need to be able to ask this question? Okay. Uh, I'm going to need some kind of distribution over future performance, right? Hiring involves some uncertainty about like, who is it who's actually, you know, who I'm going to be getting. Um, most of the domains where the Rooney Rule is being applied are what you might call creative professions, where there's a kind of unbounded domain of how good they could do in the future. Again, think about hiring researchers and, you know, to take some crass numerical measure, maybe we're trying to estimate, you know, at the end of their career, what will be their Google Scholar citation count, right? A terrible thing to focus on as a unidimensional quantity, but sort of it, it conveys the, the idea, right? Um, you know, if we're using this rule to figure out, you know, who in our portfolio of recording artists we hired, we might be looking at song downloads. Uh, we're looking at revenue generated if we're trying to hire uh, salespeople and so forth. 
All of these have the property that they tend to come from heavy tail distributions, right? There's an enormous amount of empirical work now on citation statistics that say your lifetime future citations is this heavy tail distribution in which outliers are quite common, right? So we'll imagine that your probability that your lifetime output exceeds t is some t to the minus 1 plus delta, okay? Um, I think I actually have parenthesized that wrong. There should be a, the minus is outside the parentheses. Okay, so good. So this is a domain in which, you know, this notion that we're trying to hire superstars is somehow formalized by the fact that we have this very heavy tail distribution. You see really big numbers. That's important. Okay, second, we have candidates applying from groups X and Y, and there are, uh, there are different compositions, right? If I have N candidates from group Y, the group that experiences no bias, I'll imagine I have alpha times N from group X. Okay, so, because the second thing that you have to worry about when you think about applying the Rooney rule is how prevalent is this group in the applicant population? If they're only 1% of the applicant population, you pay a very large cost by committing one of your slots to them. If they're at parity, if alpha equals one, then in fact, the bias might be hurting a, a huge number of people. Um, okay, I'm gonna make the assumption because it's sort of the most basic assumption you can make that all are drawn from the same power law distribution Z. We clearly look at the case where the two groups, maybe because of future bias they're going to experience, might come, might experience different distributions going forward in the future. But we'll, we'll, we'll start with this one. And finally, so far there's no bias in this situation. So far groups X and Y are indistinguishable. Let's add bias. So there's some evidence from psychometric work on implicit bias that for some of these estimates, when you actually do experiments, have people look at CVs, make estimates relative to, for example, true lifetime citation counts, that there's, uh, there's often a, something that looks like a multiplicative offset in these estimates. So we'll imagine there's a bias parameter beta, beta for bias, greater than one, so that the selection committee picking people um, believes that the potential of the ith x candidate, which is xi, uh, they evaluate as xi divided by beta. Okay. So their estimate is knocked down by beta. That may again be because of implicit bias they can't control, maybe because of explicit bias that they actually are downweighting it, but one way or another that's what's happening. And then they have to pick a short list of k. So fundamentally, it's this pipeline. Applicants are drawn from this. Some are X candidates, some are Y candidates. Uh, they all get sorted, but the X candidates all get scaled down by this factor one over beta before they get merged sorted in. Uh, and then we pick the top K. So for example, here, if K were three, the Rooney rule wouldn't be necessary because one of your three on your short list already is an X candidate. But if K were two, this list would be unacceptable. You would need to pick uh, this third candidate. And so here's the question that we ask. Why might the Rooney rule be helping? After all, I'm restricting your actions. Previously, you had an unconstrained optimization problem where you could pick any K you wanted. Now I'm making you only pick list of K where one of them is from group X. Why might that possibly be helping? Well, because of course, the point is that the people in group X have been shifted down. And so when I'm only allowed to pick the top two and I swap in this person for that person, it might be a win because this person may have been better and was just divided down by beta, or maybe a loss because maybe the reason this blue bar is above the red one is because they really were better, right? That's somehow the issue, right? That what it's doing is putting people into the short list who may have been knocked out because of bias, but may have been knocked out just because they were ranked lower. Uh, that's what we have to think about, right? So there may be a performance gain, there may be a performance uh, hit, and we, we have to figure out which one we're Okay. So that's the question we're asking. I should mention that actually this is sort of a natural example of something from economic theory known as delegation. Um, delegation is a, which actually dates back to one of the first articulations of the theory of delegation was actually in uh, the Nobel laureate Bengt Holstrom's PhD thesis from the 1970s. Delegation is a very constrained form of uh, the broader topic of mechanism design. And mechanism design a principle makes up a set of rules for a game that agents play and they're trying to create a certain behavior. Uh, but mechanism design tends to involve things like monetary transfers where you reward people differently for what they do. Delegation says we have a situation where all the principal can do is refuse to accept certain solutions. They send the agent out to search for a solution, but they say, I'll reject the follow solutions with the following predicate. And so you have to find something that passes my filter. And by constraining the agent's action, they're actually trying to actually create a better solution by overcoming bias. So, this is, so you think of the Rooney rule as a very simple form of delegation where somewhere higher up the chain, someone says, I won't accept lists that are only Y candidates. And finally, the utility is the K finalist just. Okay, so the main result in, in uh, the work that Manisha have been doing is a characterization for every shortlist size K 
of the choices of alpha, the pool composition, what fraction are x candidates, beta, the level of bias, and delta, the power law exponent, a bunch of outliers, um, for which the Rooney rule produces actually a positive change in expectation rather than a negative change in expectation. And, yeah? So going back to this slide, the utility is the sum. Yeah. Uh, doesn't correspond to, say, this, you know, you're choosing one. Yeah, so that was what I said earlier, where the other natural thing would be the utility is somehow the max. I'll, I'll come back to max, time permitting. I, I may run out of time on that. Um, my argument for the sum is that in many of these situations where the Rooney rule is being applied, it's, in some sense, everyone is benefiting from being interviewed, again, because of this notion that in interviews are generating more interviews, both now and, and temporally going forward. Everyone may not be benefiting equally, the one that you choose is. But some appears sort of was actually part of the original motivation, right? Part of the original motivation for interviewing uh, minority head coaching candidates was that that was actually leading to sort of them getting more interviews in the future, them being sort of more in the, in the sort of working set of people trying, trying to recruit. So some is some kind of approximation. But I'll, I'll come back and, and think about Max also. Um, it's also the case that the Rooney rule is increasingly being uh, used, for example, for things like I'm giving out a prize to five people. I want one to be from a group where I'm treating them symmetrically. You know, I'm creating an advisory committee of eight people. I want one to be from. And so there the, the use of some is maybe more apparent. But in general, you would want maybe some LP norm key between one. Yeah, and you, right. You might want something where like, yeah. And that would be natural to look at also. Um, OK. So. You can get some characterization. I want to talk about a couple of things we sort of, that we learned from thinking about this characterization. And in particular, I wanted to, independent of the technical details here, sort of zero in on two things purely mathematically about the nature of bias that I feel like I didn't understand before we did this that I now understand better. And so I want to sort of pull those two out and talk about them. OK. So first of all, here's the actual form of the statement. For every constant k greater than 2, there's some explicit function phi sub k. So it improves utility if and only if some property of this is greater than 1. Um, uh, implicitly, this basically says, if I fix, let's think about fixing alpha and delta, which are two things that are actually measurable. Right? I can measure the fraction of people who are uh, X candidates. And I can, from past history, measure the distribution of lifetime future performance and get some power law exponent, delta. Alpha and delta, I know. Beta is arguably the elusive one. Um, so you can think of this as defining an implicit function that says, for any alpha and delta, what is the beta at which I start using the Rooney rule, right? At some level of bias, I say, now the level of bias is so high, I need to start using it. And it's going to be a function of alpha and delta. So we, we can think of that. Beta is implicitly a function. Um, and OK, the actual functional forms of these, even for k equals 2, uh, rather complicated. Uh, so I'm not really going to talk about the functional forms. It was striking to us that it's so complicated because I've told you the whole model. There's not a lot going on in the model. And so the fact that this is the exact condition is a little surprising. But if you plot this implicit function of beta I was talking about, you get this, which in its own way is also sort of complicated. Um, so l let me sort of walk you through this, because embedded in this is sort of uh, two things, as I said, that I felt like I learned about bias uh, from staring at this. So again, alpha goes this way. This is shrinking alpha. Uh, delta goes this way. This is shrinking. So as we go this way, there are fewer and fewer x candidates. And so it makes sense that this thing is peeling upwards, because you need more and more bias to be willing to use the Rooney rule. Right? If only 20% of your pool is X candidates, if only 5% of your pool is X candidates, you would need a lot of bias to be willing to use it. Maybe no amount of bias would be sufficient. Let's come back to that question. Um, delta is a little more complicated. Right? So as delta goes to 0, I get more and more heavy tail distributions where the outliers get more and more extreme. That tends to have the property that when somebody wins, they may be winning by a huge amount. And so you're very hesitant to swap them out for somebody else. And so this sort of peels upward as delta gets small also. Although not completely, because there's this totally weird region, which I won't try to explain in this talk, where it's actually non-monotone, where as you vary delta, you go from, wanting, from not wanting to use the rule to wanting to use it to not wanting to use it again. Um, and so complicated things are happening. Let's first talk about this cliff, though, because this is actually climbing to infinity. And this cliff climbing to infinity is sort of an interesting point, which says this is the frontier at which you wouldn't even want to use the Rooney rule in the case of infinite bias. <coughs> As you mentioned, this whole surface is for k equals 2. So let me do this discussion for k equals 2, where it's already messy enough. Okay. So what does that frontier look like? Right? What are the values uh, of alpha and delta for which the Rooney rule does or doesn't improve utility as the bias goes infinity? In other words, when should we reserve a slot for an x candidate in the case of infinite bias? Now, this is sort of an interesting question. So it says, suppose I'm giving out a prize to two people. Um, 
And if I didn't constrain people's behavior, they would always just give it to the top two Y candidates, because somehow when they go to give out awards, Y candidates are the only names that come to mind. But I could constrain their behavior and say, no, this award will have one goes to an X candidate, one goes to a Y candidate. I'm imposing that. Now, we'd like to look back 20 years later at the history of our award, look at everyone's Google Scholar citation counts maybe, add them up and say, in which world are we, are we going to be prouder of the people who we gave the award to? In the world where I was always just giving it to two Y candidates, or in the world where I gave it to one X and one Y? And that's a concrete question. We could go and look at where, in which one do I increase the sum of expectation. Um, the surprising fact, uh, which in the end has an explanation that makes sense, is that no matter how small the fraction of X candidates, there's a small enough parallel exponent so that you should use the Rooney rule. In other words, even if only 5% of your pool is from group X, there's some small enough power locks, meaning a heavy enough tail on the distribution, that even though only 5% come from group X, you should still, if I'm trying to maximize utility, reserve a slot for someone from group X. And the other slots for the 95% from group Y. Okay. And, and for a very concrete performance-based reason. Because if you look back later and look at how did these random variables actually turn out, you will actually have done better by reserving that slot. Um, so I can sort of just sketch why that's true, but then let me talk about why that's, why that's so weird. Um, oh, this is talk about? As bias is going to infinity. This is bias. Yeah, yeah, so this, is, this, this slide is all about k equals to infinite bias, which means you would never give it on your own. Yeah. Um, actually, I let me run through the proof and then let me talk about why it's so weird. So, the argument is Z star is the expected maximum of N draws from power law of X minus 1 plus delta. This is the value of the top Y candidate. Because the top Y candidate comes from N people. I'm drawing a power law from each one, and I'm taking the best one. Because again, my ability to rank within each group is perfect in this simple model. The problem is I just can't merge them. I'm always putting Y candidates to X candidates. Now, without the Rooney rule, the other candidate we pick will certainly be the second Y candidate because we have infinite bias. And if you do a little work with maxima of power laws, you get that the expected value of that one is delta over 1 plus delta times the Z star. With the Rooney rule, the other candidate will be the top X candidate. That's now Z star, but scaled down by the fact there are only alpha N of them. And so I get, again, doing a little work with power laws, it turns out to be alpha to the 1 over 1 plus delta times Z star. I just compare these two. I cancel the Z star, and I get it improves utility if alpha is greater than delta over 1 plus delta to the 1 plus delta. So therefore, no matter how small alpha is, there's a sufficiently small delta, so alpha is bigger than but let me tell you why we wrote down this thing, and then we're like, this can't be right. Because think about what we're saying. We have 100%, we have 100 applicants, 100%. Um, say 20% are from group Y. We're reserving a slot for them. Take group X, which has 80% of the people. Split it in half. Call them arbitrarily group A and group B. Each has 40% of the people. Now, the best person from group A in expectation is better than the best person from group X. Because there are 40% of group A's and only 20% of group A. The best person from group B is better than the best person from group X. And yet, for some reason, we're saying we're, treat, we're lumping together A and B, each of whom has someone better than group X, and we're treating group X separately. How can that possibly be improving utility, right? It seems wrong. Right? You see the problem. If I just chose to think of group X as having these two groups of 40% each, so what's going on? So what's going on is that it's not the case that we're comparing um, A, the best in A and the best in X against the best in A and the best in B. In both cases, we're picking the best of A union B. We're always getting the better of those two. The other one we pick from, from A union B is known to be the second best. And when you have a very, very heavy-tailed power law, whereas the person from group X, because of the infinite bias, we have no idea what the upper bound on them is. And so the point is, when you have a very heavy-tailed power law, the value of not having some conditional upper bound on their performance is extremely powerful. The fact that we know that the second per Y candidate that we picked is not the top person already puts this big constraint on how high they, I mean, they're probably very good, but there's some upper bound. The person group X, there's no upper bound, because the bias meant we never actually directly compared them to someone genuinely. Okay. So that was the first thing I learned about bias that I really hadn't kind of understood. Uh, I have time, but it really follows from very simple assumptions, and it's interesting that it's happening in this power law regime, which is exactly the realm of Google Scholar counts 
view counts, download statistics, where we often apply things like the Rooney rule. Um, let me tell you the second thing I learned about uh, bias from this. Um, and that's the following. So when we, when we go to analyze this, the basic object that we need to understand in this analysis is what you might call an expectation conditional on comparison. Okay, so that's the following thing. The expectation of some random variable A, given that A is greater than C, t constant C times some other random variable B. Think of A and B as sort of the top, this is kind of a stylized thing. I'm abstracting from the analysis we're doing. <laughs> Think of A and B as the top candidates in, in the two groups. C is some level of bias. It says, we only, you know, when we pick A, it's because they have to be like bigger than two times B. And so we're interested in how they are given that they're bigger than two times the top candidate in the other group, right? Because there's a bias to a factor of two, right? So now we're back in the world of finite bias where things are more complicated. Um, and so syntactically, it's a very compact thing to write down. We felt like we understood it going in, but it turns out this kind of construction is a real mess, okay? This idea that this person is better than twice this other person, both of whom are drawn from some distribution. So, and this actually showed up in the empirical work, for example, in Cynthia Dubois' work on the, on, on the Rooney Rule, where a natural question to ask is, what was the win-loss record of minority head coaches before the Rooney Rule, and what was the win-loss record afterwards? And you actually find, again, there are small numbers, and now there's really small numbers being involved, but that somehow, so within some approximation, the win-loss record of minority head coaches before the renewal was actually slightly higher, potentially because they were passing through a stronger filter because of the bias. Afterwards, they became more, more, more equalized. That's sort of intuitive. Higher filters should mean they're doing better. Um, but is that really what's going on? So let's say I have these independent random variables A and B drawn from some distribution, and I'm going to define a function of C. I'm going to sweep over the bias and ask what happens to this expectation. In other words, how good is a candidate A experiencing bias when they have to be twice as good as the competition because of bias? How good do I expect them to be when they have to be three times as good as the competition because of bias? How about 10 times as good? Right? That's what happens as I sweep across C. So F of C is how good I expect this candidate to be when they're subjected to a level of bias equal to a factor of C. Um, what can we say about this? For example, here's the most simple thing you'd like to ask. Is it monotone increasing in C? If candidates have to pass through increasing levels of bias, does it follow that an expectation they're better. Okay. I could tell this actually as a, say, a parable about hiring. Let's say I had two research labs. Both research labs prefer hiring applied people to theory people. So in the first research lab, they're going to, every year, they're going to interview a theory candidate and an applied candidate. And the theory candidate has to be at least twice as good as the applied candidate to get hired. Um, the other lab, drawing from the same distribution, interviews a theory candidate and an applied candidate, and but the theory candidate has to be three times as good or more compared to the applied candidate in order to get hired. Now we're gonna look back retrospectively 20 years later, there will be fewer theory candidates at the second lab. Will they be better on average? Because they have to pass through the higher filter. Right. That's, that's the monotonicity question. And the answer is not necessarily. They might actually be, for some distributions, they might actually be lower. And that's the sense in which I mean, this, this quantity is a complete mess that we don't really fully understand. Here's a simple example uh, to convince you of this. Imagine this is the distribution, so it's just a four-point distribution. Actually, there are even simpler distributions where this happens. Um, so imagine every year this theory and applied candidate are drawn from a distribution where their qualities are either 1, 5, 9, or 13 uniformly at random. So the sample space is just this four-by-four four grid. There are 16 possible kinds of recruiting years that you can have. Right? This is the quality of the theory candidate, this is the quality of the applied candidate. What does the event A greater than 2B look like? It says, in these four kinds of years, you end up hiring the theory candidate. Right? So, when the theory candidate's 13 and the applied candidate's 5, that's greater than 2 times 5, so you hire them, similarly these three. And so your expected value is the average quality over these, which is 10. When you have to be three times as good, then the slope shifts downward and you're only averaging over these three points, right? Because you can only hire a theory candidate in this world when the applied candidate was really, really bad, which actually puts less of a constraint on the theory candidate. So here actually you do the average and it's 9. So it says, if I were to go and look at the research labs 20 years later in this very stylized scenario, the research lab with the higher filter actually has worse theory candidates on it, worse theory people on average, right? And in real life, we would look at this and we'd say that could be for any number of reasons, which in real life would probably be the dominant reasons. For example, a lab with that high a filter is probably going to be unwelcoming to theoreticians who won't want to go there, and so that's why you have weaker people there. Or if they really have such a high filter, they're probably also bad at evaluating theoreticians as they pick the wrong people. Maybe that's true also. But neither of those has to be true. 
This could happen for purely arithmetical reasons, right? And that's somehow the point that this is a very messy concept that we're dealing with, right? And somehow this is at the heart of what we have to do when we analyze the effect of something like the Rooney rule. We're looking at these expectations uh, conditional on comparison. Okay. Um, almost, yeah, question. Example hold up if A and B were coming from heavy tail distributions or No, so actually for heavy tail distributions, one thing we have to prove, which this suggests some of the non triviality, is well, at least for power law distributions, um, it, they actually that function is monotone, which is somehow the first step we need. Um, you can certainly have a continuous density function where it's not monotone. I just put some bumps into it and then I simulate something like this. Uh, actually, we don't know, it's a nice question. Do all, say, unimodal just density functions have the property that this thing is monotone increasing? Someone may know the answer to that we weren't able to figure out. So much of this analysis is based on expectations, which means you kind of, which suggests that you have to run this process many, many times to you know, get the predicted effect. Yeah. Are there any kind of bounds that say, well, how, how many times do we have to do this for, the, you know, for, the, for these effects to show with high probability or something? Yeah, that's it. Interesting question because, right, it's based on outliers. Now, the outliers are relatively frequent because it's power law. But, yeah, um, we have some, 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 some work on that, sort of how fast this is, uh, this is converging. Um, it's, yeah, I don't think there's necessarily a crisp answer because it's going to depend on, on the power law exponent. Um, but the convergence here is actually reasonably fast. And it's also reasonably fast. The other parameter in which we might ask about convergence is the number of applicants n, because all of these are asymptotic statements in that. Um, there, the convergence is relatively quick in that the correction terms that we're dealing with are things like sort of 1 plus log n over n. And so once n gets to be in the hundreds, we're actually seeing this. Um, but yeah, it's it definitely an interesting question. The expectations also say expectations of power laws are part of the challenge here, right? When we're, we're looking at sort of average, you know, um, What's the total revenue? Now, of course, average is often what you care about, right? If I'm hiring a team of salespeople, I care about the total revenue they generate. I don't care about some other thing. Um, but it, it's an issue, uh, an issue that we have to think about. It, um, we could do a similar analysis saying, what is the probability that the Rooney rule produces a positive change, for example, rather than the expected change? Uh, and then we get a somewhat simpler analysis, um, but still has some of the subtlety that we're seeing here. Yeah. On the previous results where you were showing what beta you needed given the other parameters, would you expect that if you add a little bit of noise to the estimation process, it would be about the same, or does it change it dramatically? Good question. Yeah. So noise is a nice, uh, a nice question to think about. The results we have right now say for sufficiently small noise, we get roughly the same results. As the noise gets larger, uh, it's an interesting question whether some non-trivial sort of discrete transition happens in in what's going on, and that's not something that we that we fully understand. In the infinite bias case, it's easy, easier to understand. In the finite bias case, it, yeah, it isn't as clear. Yeah, other questions. Um, let me ask a kind of timekeeping question. Let's wrap up in like two, three. Yeah. Yeah. Five to ten minutes. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, in that case, let me mention because you asked about Max. Let me mention one more thing, uh, less complicated than the reasoning about the the Rooney rule, which uh, sort of goes even more directly to Scott Page's work on diversity, uh, and then I'll wrap up. So fundamentally what we've been talking about is we're, about, we're choosing a short list of k people out of n people. And there have really been two things we've been talking about. One is how do we evaluate individuals? What score do we give them? And the other is this question of how do we evaluate the set? And so far the set we've just been summing. But we might want to use some other function to evaluate the set. Um, and what happens if we have some other function, right? So the point is, if we're just evaluating by the sum, we should be doing what we've been doing. We should compute everybody's expected value and take the max expected value. But what if we're back in this interviewing context where really the reason we looked at k people was to pick the best one? Should we actually, right? Okay, so imagine the following setup. I look at the applicants. I have to assign each one a numerical score. I have to rank them by their score. But I'm going to be judged on the best person I pick because maybe this is an interview context. Maybe I'm a graduate admissions committee that says what we really want is for the most famous graduate from our program to be as high as possible. Maybe we're choosing a team and we want, you know, we're going to be judged by the best idea anyone on the team has. But for all those reasons, max is kind of a, a natural thing to look at. How do we do if we use the expectation as a score? Is there some other score we should be using? So let me show you one final example, which I think also sort of teaches us something about the problem with assigning scores. So this is the sort of you know, contest objective. We're going to bring in the K shortlist. We're going to pick one after the interview. And we're scored by, by the max. 
So using the mean to sort people has the following uh, worrisome behavior. Think of k as large here. Suppose I just had a pool, I had 2k applicants. k of them produce value, are high risk, high reward. They produce value k minus 1 with probably 1 over k. And k of them are really safe, deterministic. They produce value 1 with probably 1. Okay. So a test that evaluates the expectation chooses the second group of candidates because they have expectation 1 rather than 1 minus a tiny bit. Uh, but as you might not be surprised to hear, uh, that would be a bad choice. I should really do is, I would certainly do much better by picking the k high risk, high, high reward ones. Why? Because each of them succeeds, overwhelmingly in this case, with probably 1 over k. So the chance that at least one of them succeeds is a constant. Right? It's 1 minus 1 minus 1 over k to the k, which is converging to 1 minus 1 over e. So with constant probability, I reap the enormous reward. Uh, and so an expectation, and again we're looking at expected value, I'm doing much better. So ranking by expected value is hurting me a lot if I, my goal is to maximize the expected uh, quality of the max. Now, Scott Page came across similar examples and sort of ended up there and said, this is the problem with using scores. Right? When you score people and you rank them, you know, and he uses this as, as an indictment of SATs and GREs, that's reducing people to a unidimensional number. And then when you sort and rank, you might actually miss the opportunity to do really well. So Maitra, Raghu, and I looked at this and were intrigued by the following question. Is the problem with scores or is the problem with expected value as the score? Right? Just because expected value isn't working, maybe there's some more clever unidimensional score I could be using that would actually let me do well. And the answer is that's actually what's happening. Here's a better test that you could use if I'm trying to pick the max. Rather than say, let's look at the mean performance of candidate I, let's look at a, a different quantity. Let's take candidate I, and again, we're in a stylized role where we assume we know their distribution. Let's imagine you drew k times from that person's distribution and you took the max. Okay? So this is the best they would do if they lived their life k times over independently. Right? This is their upside potential. Let me use that as the score. It's again just a single number. So I throw away all the information about the distribution. I just keep that one number. That's now my new GRE score, my new SAT score. And I sort by that. Then the theorem you can prove um, is that there's some absolute constant, so C, so this is actually a factor of C approximation to the optimum. Right? If I could know everything about the distribution and solve the NP-hard optimization problem of picking the K that we're going to have the highest expected maximum, um, I would not do better than a factor of C times what I'm doing by simply computing this metric and sorting on it. So there are a couple things, and this will be my final point here, um, a couple things that we learned from this, right? One is that just because a vanilla test isn't working, like the expected value, doesn't mean that the idea of unidimensional test isn't working. Sometimes you just need a more subtle test. The other is that it was sort of striking that you know, we often think about, you know, the importance of hiring employees or admitting students based on potential, right? We're not looking at performance, we're looking at potential. Um, the question is, what might potential mean? This is sort of one argument, that it's saying, let's not look at their mean value, let's look at their sort of top 1 over k quantile value. That's their upside potential. And notice that k is scaled to the size of the team that you're picking. Right? So if I'm admitting 10 people, I'm interested in the 1 10th quantile. If I'm admitting 100 people, I might be interested in the 1 100th quantile. Again, in a world where I'm optimizing the max. The max is a particular thing you might want to optimize. Um, more generally, there's a lot of interesting questions here, some of which we've resolved, some of which are nice open questions, about given the way in which you evaluate sets, is there a single unidimensional test score you, you can apply? And the answer is sometimes yes, sometimes no. You can construct situations where there is no single number you can put on each person's distribution that actually gets you to within a constant factor of optimal. All right, so with that all, I'll wrap up. As I said, this has been, in part, a definitional activity, right? Going into a lot of the literature on fairness, on diversity and selection, on bias selection, and to think about some of the basic uh, rules that people are using, trying to build models around them so we can get some in insights in into what's going on. In a lot of these cases, I think what we're finding is you can get quite complex behaviors from relatively simple in in interventions, right? Things like the Rooney rule, things like selecting people so as to achieve the max. Um, you can write down very simple specifications that induce very, very complicated uh, behaviors. And I think all of these lead to interesting open questions when we embed this in some kind of larger context, right? In the end, the reason we introduce you know, an intervention like risk scores, the reason we inter introduce an intervention like the Rooney rule is because we're thinking about 
the dynamics of time going forward. We're thinking about what the world's going to look like five years from now or 10 years from now if we implement this rule. And of course, dynamics over time are going to introduce their own set of complex behaviors. They're going to change the mix of people that we see in the training and test sets that we work with. They're actually going to even, as the economists tell us, change people's decisions about effort. Right? Because if you're being evaluated in a biased world and there's bias against you, there's essentially a tax on your effort. For every unit of effort you put in, you're only getting back one minus epsilon reward because some of that effort is actually being lost to the bias against you. And in that kind of a world, uh, people where there's bias against them are going to actually make different decisions about effort. Right? They're actually going to rationally potentially invest less effort, thereby, you know, sort of in an unfortunate way, reinforcing the bias. Right? Because of the bias, they invest less effort, and that somehow confirms what people believe in the bias. And you get into this very dangerous positive feedback loop. The point being, some of these interventions can help break that feedback loop. Right? If we force people to look beyond the bias they have, that actually changes the incentive calculation that people in the, bi in the bias group might make about in investing effort and actually break out of that. Uh, so I think there are some very interesting questions about the dynamics over time, both in the data that we see, in the incentives. Uh, and that's going to, I think, lead to a lot of interesting work going forward. Thanks very much. I'll start one off with a quick one out there. So have you thought about, especially given the, the challenges with evaluating folks and um, sensitivity analysis applied to this, yeah. to get a sense for various kinds of variance over what you know, really slamming the results and, and, um, and, and doing, doing the, a job on them in terms of the clarity of the category. Yeah. So I think there's a you a question with your mic on. Oh yeah, yeah. So right. So the question is, um, given the difficulties in forming accurate evaluations of people, what happens when there's variance in the estimates? Yeah, I guess I would say two things. Which is, the notion of variance is operating at two two levels. First of all, all of these cases we're talking about people where what I see about them is a distribution, and their true performance can be drawn from that distribution. So in some sense, the models all build variance in, and I think what it's telling us is that the heavier the tail in the power law the more uncertainty I have about how large the outlier is, is going to be. So in, the, in a way, these all sort of almost start from the difficulty in forming it. Right? All of these questions would be different if I had a deterministic evaluation of each person. Everyone's being drawn from distribution. But then there's error in the parameters. Yeah, errors in the parameters now is sort of the second level of this. Um, yeah, so I think, again, in, in, in some of these cases, I think what's happening is it gets much, much more challenging when, when there's large variance. So most of the results, that we have basically say, for sufficiently small errors, we get roughly something that sort of changes continuously in what I've been talking about here. Um, but it's an interesting question, sort of what's the threshold? Like how much error can we tolerate before qualitatively different behaviors start happening? Yeah, and a lot of that's largely an open question. Hi, uh, John and Paul. Okay. Would it be practical in some cases to measure beta from, from a group and then, and then adjust your selection algorithms instead of trying to, to fix the bias? Yeah, the that's a nice question. Uh, can we measure beta and then maybe use that? So there's sort of two questions there. One, is it plausible we might be able to measure some notion of beta? There, potentially, uh, and we've thought a little about this and have a couple, because to the extent that alpha and delta are sort of known, uh, the sort of one missing thing, and, and the selection rate is known, sort of one missing thing there is, is, is beta. And in some sense, some of the uh, behavioral work has started to get into trying to estimate that, that quantity, mainly through uh, lab experiments, although we could do it with historical data. Now the question, can we use that as an intervention? We could say, what you should do is just adjust your estimates by beta. That will correct for the, for the bias. I think the challenge there is one very important thing about the Rooney rule, and actually everything uh, in the analysis that we did, is that it never requires people to write down a number and manipulate the number. All it ever does is ask people to make ordinal comparisons between things. And what that's consistent with is the fact that in, in the sort of field work on this and also some of the lab work, it's very hard. Like, you would like to say, you know, say we really care about Google Scholar count just as a pedagogical feature. We don't necessarily really have that be our one-dimensional feature. It's very hard to get people to say, I'm going to look at a candidate. I'm going to say, future Google Scholar count, 12,000. This one, future Google Scholar account, 14,000. Okay, that person wins, but I'm going to divide down by 1.2 because of bias. Even before you ever got to the factor 1.2, the idea that you're going to write down estimates, that seems very, very hard for people to do. And so what people are doing, is, so this is sort of a, a model in which there's an abstraction barrier, 
there are numbers operating below the surface, but all the people are ever doing is making ordinal comparisons and the interventions operating there. But, but I, I think it's very interesting the mapping. Yeah. Couldn't K be the intervention? Couldn't K be the intervention where you adjust the threshold? So oh, you, you, you mean randomly select it. How big should the shortlist be? Yeah. yeah, so you could have an intervention that says you must continue interviewing people until you get to, say, a candidate from Group X. Um, uh, that would be a sort of no. I meant, I meant fix k with pick a k with a probability distribution. Yeah. The data every year you pick the different k, and doesn't that give you information on? Oh, I see. Like if there's variation in k, and then um, again that would be helpful in estimating beta. Again, I'm, I'm not sure that would help with people trying to form their own numerical estimates. I I do, I do think it's somehow key in these models that. The agents being modeled are making ordinal comparisons, not, not numerical evaluations. But yeah, if there were natural variation in, in K. It's also the case that the, the Rooney rule as introduced so far says one out of K. But you know, there's presumably some actual parameter like L out of K, right? You can imagine an Lth order Rooney rule that says you must have L of your K slots be reserved for a group. And uh, it's certainly not clear that, in fact, obviously it's not the case that one is always the optimal number. Our comparison here has been about one versus zero, but you know, one versus two versus three is right. I'll let you keep going. So, so in real life, if I'm going to interview K people for a job, then I'm going to give one person a job. And you yep. alluded to it a little bit in your graph of, uh, of number of coaches. And you said, yep. oh, maybe recently we've just decided that the, the, basically the decision is made in advance. And I go through the motions of interviewing K yep. people, which include at least one underrepresented person. Um, have, have you done any, any thinking about, like, is there something more we learn? Presumably we do the interviewing in a reasonable world to learn something more about the candidates in order to make a better informed decision. Yeah. Have you done any, any analysis on like hidden information and how that might yeah, affect this model of who then actually gets a job? Yeah, so I, I think that's, that's an interesting question. As you can see, in we, like in the discussion of the max at the end, the way, the way we're modeling it there is there's a random variable some, some distribution, the act of interviewing now materializes a value from it, which is a very extreme form of, you know, the distribution represents my uncertainty. Now I have a deterministic value. You could imagine uh, sort of things, and some of this shows up in some of the theoretical economics work on discrimination in, in the labor market, which deals with very different models that we're talking about. Where, for example, there's a temporary labor market and a permanent labor market. So some nice work that uh, Lily Hu and Yiling Chen at, at uh, Harvard just looked at recently, where the temporary labor market gives me better information about the candidate, but still not perfect. And then that allows me to make decisions about the permanent labor market. That allows us to model things such as I have a three-month in internship program in which I learn some you know, information about the candidate, but it's not that I now know everything, right? And so, uh, so there's this interesting sort of staging effect where I could invest different amounts of effort, right? I could interview someone for one day or two days. I could give them an internship for two months or three months. I could do a variety of things that are going to come at different costs and you know, increase the amount of information I have about this person or reduce the uncertainty I have about this person. And so I think uh, some, some of the work in that domain may, may also pro pro provide some insight into what this, how this might work. Well, so uh, at the end, you mentioned this idea of the max and sort of bringing it back to where you were earlier and definitions of fairness. Calibration is expected value, right? And you could transform that from instead of being one zero recidivism to actually estimation of harm, right? And take a max over a group where you start matching based on features. That's true. So if we start thinking in this rank based world and, and in defaulting on loans, right? It can be actually, again, an unbounded variable of the amount lost. Yeah. So how do we start thinking of fairness in this world of you know, ranking based on max? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question um, where, where we're doing some kind of ordinal ranking. Um, yeah, so we've. We looked a little, a little bit at this because ranking is actually a nice intervention uh, when I'm trying to say take an existing policy based on a human estimate of risk and then using some kind of algorithmic intervention. And so one thing we've looked at in the empirical work that we've been doing on judges and bail um, is, is to say let's, let's imagine a judge that releases some number of people. We'd like to use the risk tool to sort them by predicted risk and basically detain the ones who are viewed as the most risky, right? And so you can imagine some interaction between the human decision maker and the algorithm based on ranking where the human picks a set, the algorithm ranks them, and then sort of knocks the most, most risky few out of it. Um, so in that domain, we might then think about the balance between different groups, right? Whether there's, 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 there's bias going on between these different groups. And we might say, for example, of this set that you knock out, we need to keep some kind of approximate composition 
bet between the groups, which would be a kind of Rooney rule-like activity applied to the algorithm's decision to sort of knock people off the top end of, uh, of the max ranking. But uh, I think there's a lot of things you could potentially do, right? Because there's now this interaction of the human decision maker's selection, the algorithm's sorting, and some notion of fairness as a, Im, implied by the composition. <laughs> so I think there are a, a, lot, a lot of interesting questions there that one could potentially try modeling. Yeah, the, the expectation of the max is an interesting thing, and it just reminded me of, with the SAT, you can take it multiple times, and then yeah. you just report the max, which sounds like kind of weird ahead of time, but given what you found, it's actually maybe a more correct thing to do than just allow people to take it once to get kind of just an expected average value. And yeah. If there's similar, like when we interview, you know, 10 people interview the candidate, perhaps we should do 10 really, really tough interviews and take the max, the max uh, response. If one person liked them, we keep them instead of kind of averaging. You know, I wonder we actually if use other... the mean. Yeah, we use. I think we're we're so used to somebody said no higher. Yeah, I think we're so used to thinking about, no yeah. <laughs> 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 about the average or the total or the sum or whatever that the max is kind of a different world. Than yeah, <laughs> yeah. Now I should say it's going to depend on um, what it is where you know this is in a world where you're optimizing for the max max performance. So, yeah. you know, I think if you were yeah, if you were going to be hiring for a commune of deep thinkers who were going to sit in their rooms and have great ideas, and then out was going to come the best idea of all of them, yeah. then yeah, if 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 you it, qualitatively, if you have a candidate who really wows somebody in one interaction, you're like, that's what we're trying to select for. We're trying to select for there being some because when I pick k people and I just get to pick the max, I'm going to get the top one over k quantile of somebody, right? That's intuitively what's happening. Right. Um, on the other hand, if you're picking, say, for a research lab where everybody is producing output and we're evaluating something much more like an LP norm closer to L1 or L2, right. uh, then I may not be optimizing for the max. Um, but the candidate selection being based on a max, like, say, GRE scores or something, is that actually one, the more yeah. correct first That one, I think, and, and you can sort of, and you can even argue other aspects of college applications, right? So, you know, candidates often try many different, say, extracurricular activities. Mm -hmm. And if they, you know, they might try six or eight of them. If they really succeed at one, that's what they write about in their application essay. And so implicitly, the system is set up for them to select the max of all the activities that, that they tried. And maybe that makes sense. You can even think of this in com completely different domains, right? If you're on vacation for five days in some you know, new place, and you're going to eat five dinners at five restaurants, and your sort of hedonic experience of the whole thing is going to be the best of the five dinners that you had, it says you should actually evaluate Yelp reviews differently, right? You should be looking at upside because in the end, you're going to rem remember the best of those five, not the median. Um, so I think the mean you'll also remember. <laughs> <laughs> the mean you also remember, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So right, probably, uh, just Chris, last question, and I'll wrap up. Yeah. So um, you, in the first part of the talk, you talked about this group calibration as one of the, the alternatives. So if you were to drop that, what would you want to replace it with? Um, well, so in, in a way, I'd want to keep the other two, right? So I had three things that were mutual. Keep those two and then drop, the, drop calibration. What do you replace it with? Um, well, I guess I would, I should check to make sure I, I understand the question. But um, I have three things right now, calibration, balance for positive, balance for negative. They're mutually incompatible. Right. In some sense, I have to drop one. So you know, one of the arguments in this work of Hard Price and Shrebro makes this argument, if we drop calibration, then we're actually just right. We don't have to put anything back in because we're now just barely going to satisfy that. Right? So we're going to equalize the positives, equalize the negatives, and we now have lost all our degrees of freedom to do anything else. And now we're just going to try optimizing accuracy with that. If I really were to put a third condition back in, I might get to some new impossibility result, which I, which I couldn't handle. So the argument that they, they, the, 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 that they make in their work is, you know, let's think about situations where calibration is not the important thing. What's important is that people who have similar behaviors should be given similar scores, and that that's really what, what fairness is. And, and that's a compelling argument in, in some domains. And so equalizing positives, equalizing negatives, I, I've now sort of exhausted my, my degrees of freedom in the, in the constraints in some sense. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks very much for that. Thanks.